The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hello, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plen Air Magazines. There are a lot of brilliant artists in the world, and some of them are absolute rebels. Well, Scott W. Pryor is one of those guys. He doesn't like to do things the way that everybody else does them, and as a result, he paints incredibly well. You're going to learn how he does cityscapes in this video today. Hi, I'm Scott W. Pryor, and today in the studio we'll be painting an urban scene of San Francisco. We'll be focusing on a trolley car on Market Street. One of my favorite areas to go hang out and watch people and watch the world go by. It's a good time to get back to basics, and I will help you work on your genre and urban scenes. Let's start with my materials. My palette, on my palette I have burnt umber, ultramarine blue, a rose matter, transparent oxide, viridian, sap green, cad red medium, cad orange medium, cad yellow medium, cad yellow light, cerulean, a warm gray, and titanium white. I do have a couple experimental colors. Those I'm just playing with to see how they work with the, um, this painting. And we'll go over that as well. My brushes, as far as my brushes, I'm, I use primarily filberts. Um, these are rosemary filberts, and I, I love their brand. They do great. And as far as paint goes, I use Rembrandt paint. I use Gamzol, and I use uh, Gamblin's solvent-free gel and their um, sapphire oil. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at my reference. Today, I'm working on a, tr a trolley car. We're gonna work on a trolley car of San Francisco. Um, the, what I really love about these is the color in them and the, they're old. They're from like the 40s and 30s and stuff and they, they get them from all over the world. This particular one, I love that it's got orange and a yellow roof and it's kind of, in a way, it's got a little happy face on it which I love about them. Um, I probably am going to edit out the guy on the bike. We'll see. I'm not sure yet. I love the warmth and the light that's hitting the, um, the trolley car and the trees in here. There's, you can see there's a little bit of sky. We'll get some of that to come through and the buildings, behind the buildings. And I love the perspective that goes back. And then you can see like the bus. There's a bus back here. And there's another car back there. So you get the depth of that as well. Um, so let's get started. First I start off with doing, getting some medium on my palette. And then I start picking up paint. I start off with a burnt umber and I thin it out and I add a little bit of the ultramarine blue just for the darkness. Now I know a lot of people prefer to start a painting with pen, like drawing it out with pencil or charcoal. I like to start it out with a brush just because it's easy to erase. So when I make a mistake, I can wipe it right out. Make this a little bit thinner. And let's go. So I'm always, I'm, I'm going to start with my focal point, but that can change because 
you know, I don't want my painting to grow too much because sometimes when we start, we it expands and we have to you have to be mindful of where your placement is. So I just loosely start to draw in my focal point, just trying to get it loose in loosely in there. So I can move it around a little bit or if I need to or play with the perspective. You know, look how far that curb comes out in front. that car it's actually a taxi just want to make sure I get it in there and I'm gonna measure I'm trying to measure like where it is that the top of the cab intersects with the trolley car it's a little higher So there's a little bus back here, or little bus. <laughs> They're kind of big actually. And I just want to, to it, the idea is to sh have some things overlap. It really helps with your perspective and the depth as well. So there's a little tiny, like it's just a little s square basically back here that goes with the street and the perspective of the street. There's, there's a line like going off of the curb. So on the other side of the street, it's like right here. And that's going back. This just helps show the depth, which goes back to a vanishing, vanishing point, which is way over there. So you got to draw it through. Sometimes drawing through the um, actual vehicle will help you. So I'll just show you how I do that sometimes. And then I come in and I erase it just so I, I know that I have my perspective right. Let's pop, see, easy. So we're setting up the perspective and now I wanna start basically setting the stage up for the trolley car and the, um, the platform, um, the Muni platform. So I want to start looking at where the buildings intersect with the trolley car that are behind it. So we can start laying those in and building off of that one. So right now I got this line right here and then there, that's which represents this edge right here with this building. So now we can build off of that line and looking at measuring proportions and stuff and the other buildings. So there, I'm going to move on to this one right here and look where that corner intersects with the trolley car and it's about here. So there's perspective for that. You got to pay attention to that. That's a, this is the top. So you can see it angles back, going back to that vanishing point way back there. Measure the perspective of the buildings. Try to get it about right. So there's two buildings right there next to each other. And now let's look where that, the first one, the one in the front, that just tucks right behind the, um, the trolley car about here. And there's a 
this one. It's a little smaller. And it and it, and it it comes down right about there. So you move this one over a little bit. Now there's trees and stuff here too. We're going to put those in, in after we set up the buildings. So there's a little, there's a building back here that connects to those buildings. Right back, right back in there. Lots of little buildings. There's this one be in the back behind there. Then there's a little gap, which I like because it shows the sky. You don't, we want it to overlap, which it does actually in the picture. So you can see back here, there's two buildings that, that are side by side behind this building. So I'm just gonna do that little, that little tidbit right there. And I might even get rid of that. I might just make it all one shape. But for right now, I just wanna get it in so I know where it is. Just setting up the puzzle. Um, all I'm doing right now is setting up the puzzle, putting, putting the pieces together. Then there's that little small gap of air back there. There's a little tiny hint of a building. And that building comes down to here. There's another building in between these two. That goes back down here. Then there's a smaller building back here. And that goes in line with that one. So that actually is a little higher. And what's fun is there's, some of the buildings are in shadow, some, some are in light. So you can see like there's this one in light, which will, and then there's one in front of it in light. So we're going to indicate those buildings. We're not going to get too detailed about with those because the main attraction is the trolley car. Perspective. Now, perspective is hard. You have to learn. You got to get out. You got to draw a lot, you know. So I've been out in San Francisco. I went to school there. So I've been out on the streets of San Francisco and I've drawn a lot of different buildings there. So I really highly recommend drawing a lot. You gotta draw a lot to get good at laying your, um, laying the drawing in for your paintings. So I'm just merely indicating them right now. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna get back into getting, putting some of the detail in this a little later. Oh, well, my car's a little bit bigger then. Put some of the so crosswalks in. a little bit so all this stuff that we see on the you know the lines and stuff that just tells the story of the street so you can people can recognize the viewer can recognize where it is if, they, if they've been there
So you had to adjust the front a little bit. All I'm doing is measuring my proportions. So I'm measuring like uh, what I'm doing was I was, I saw where my street is and then there's a little line of like where this red area is right here. So I want to get that in, but I got to get the perspective right, which showed that my trolley car wasn't tall enough. We're about right with it now. More adjustments. See, it's easy with, the, with paint. You just have to work thin, you can't work thick. And I think I'm, I'm going to leave this guy out. I mean, even though I really want it just to be about this and the people that are waiting to get on here. Because there's, there's a door for the trolley and then you have people going down waiting at the little platform. So let's draw in some of the platform stuff. Weird little roof. <laughs> Weird little roof. And you have people all here waiting in line to get on the trolley car. And there's a, a rail right here. This rail, if you see this rail right here, that actually goes right in line with the, um, the curb, the sidewalk on the other side of the street. So that turns into, right here, this is the curb, that turns into the rail. Look, I messed up again. Once we get the drawing in, that's, that's the hard part, is getting the drawing laid in. At least for me it is. But once I set it up, I'm ready to go. people just to indicate them we're not going to get too detailed with them we just want to make it look like there's people all right now let's start working on back here and the trees get it set up with the trees so there's this tree popping down which I'm actually going to take that out as well. I love the light hitting the trees.
This one's nice because it blocks the building. You don't have to get all, you don't have to be too literal. With the tree, you can kind of fudge a little bit. If you draw it a little off, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. Get that window in just to show a little buildingness. Actually, we'll go over that, overlap, showing more depth. All right, looking nice. It's getting set up. There's a tree back here. And then there's like, you can tell there's a tree here. Maybe we'll put that in, I'm not sure yet, but we, at least we'll put some of the shadows down here just to indicate that there's another tree around. Get my crosswalk in. Crosswalk lines. So I like the angles. It reads, it reads really well. So you can, it brings your eye through it. If you look at the, the angles and stuff. You can go back here and then you hit the trees and the trees bring you back into the focal point, which is right here. Speaking of the focal point, let's put a little bit more stuff on here to get it going. Just so I have it down. And you can see where I'm going with it. This part wraps around. See the smile on your face? Now, I want to look at what's going on back in here. So, I have my, my photo up in editing on in iPhotos. So I just want to, um, I'm going to hit the adjust button and then I'm going to play with the exposure and stuff to look back here to see what's going on. And I'll do this from time to time just so I can read. Oh, see, look, there's a whole bunch of stuff back here. We're going to indicate some of that stuff. We'll lose it too, but not, you know, I just wanted to show you that how photos, photos darken stuff as we all know, right? So you have to go in and adjust the values, the exposure, the brightness, and your contrast, just so that it looks like what you, when you were there, you know? So you go dark, right? We'll put that back to normal. Let's go down to brightness, check that out. Brighten it up. Contrast. That's actually kind of how it was, right about there with the contrast when I was there. But I like the the shapes and the values because with the original photo, because that pops out the um, trolley car. So let's get back. Let's get into laying in some of the darks. Um, just to get started. Actually, I'm going to work on my trolley car a little bit more and then I'll get into doing the background stuff and we'll play with those values again. I just want to make sure my drawing is okay with this.
All right, let's get let's get into this stuff. Use a bigger brush. I'm just I'm gonna adjust a little bit of it again, just so I can see. what's going on back there. And now that I've lightened it up a little bit, you can see the, the um, lines. And because the, the trolley cars are actually, they're electric and they run on a line and there's they have this little, the thing that connects to the line, the electric line for them, which now I can see it. So, gonna have to get that in there just to show. For people to see. Now I'm going to try not to, when I first start out with my darks and lightening things, I try to use color. So like you can see right here, I used, I'm using the ultramarine blue, the rose matter, and then to lighten it up a little bit, I'm using the cerulean um, just to play with that and get my values going. Because you want it, I want it dark, but I don't want it too dark right now. We can always adjust it later. The blue, I like this blue purpley color because it'll pop the um, orange and yellow out because we're going to start right back in behind it. In reality, it's not blue and purple, but dark. There's a little wall right there too. So we're going to make sure we get that in because that separates. So this is right here. Probably to Bart or something. I want to keep it thin. Thin to where, thin enough to where you can actually see like some of the canvas showing through a little bit. So I made this darker than this area here because it's it's um and it's before it you know so this will recede back because there's like a little patio and all that stuff back in here where that umbrella is okay let's get into back into this purples purpley very purpley. That's from Elf. It's very purpley. My kids and I, we watch Elf a lot, especially during the holidays. So some of those lines are in my head. <laughs> Actually, there's, there's another, I don't know, that's actually, there's a building right here that's like light, and I'm going to use that. So I'm going to go, I'm going to erase this part here, and I'm going to do the building next to it that's darker. And 
and we'll lighten and fix things as we go because there's a ref there's a whole bunch of windows on this building so if you look at this building right here there's all the, this window it's all windows and so there's reflection hitting it which will lighten some of it up so it's going to start off dark but it'll end up being a little bit lighter and then when you get over here you can see all the reflections of the, the windows and the buildings across the street hitting the windows stuff you need to pay attention to when you're doing urban stuff because that's how it goes We'll just make that dark for now. And we'll come back and play with that in a little bit. Indicate, scratch in. So I use all, I use all parts of the brush. I use, I use the tip. Here, I'll use a white brush. That way you can see what I'm doing. So I use all parts of the brush. I can use the tip, the edge. I mean, even sometimes this part, I. Simi will be all mad because I don't know what this part's called. But anyways, that, scra that scrapes into it a little bit and leaves happy little accidents. And I use the tip to scratch, redraw. Sometimes I leave the, those parts alone. So that's what I was talking about with scratch. So I come in and scratch into it. Just so I know that's the corner of that building. Maybe it needs to move over a little bit. about there there we go oh look this is a big building what am I doing it goes way over here it's easy to get lost in um, doing urban buildings buildings in urban settings so it's easy like I get lost all the time with my drawings and stuff so this intersects right of over to the left of the edge of the trolley car. So what I'm going to do is just erase some of this stuff so that I know to come back into it with lights because of the reflections that we were just talking about. Scrape into it. So the, there's air holes in the tree and I just want to make sure I get some of that dark behind the tree. Staying with this part here. Going back to this building right here. There's a little, there's a window right here. Goes to the corner of the building. And there's another one back here down here that the tree overlaps and then you don't see there's one down here too this tree overlaps this a little bit more we'll just knock those in as dark little shapes for right now adjusting them later if we need to and then there's the line of the build the windows that go with these windows from the corner so you use your perspective and adjust as you go down it flattens out a little bit So a little tiny part of light, piece of light hitting right here. Let's raise that up a little bit higher. So there's a little sliver of light coming through. That's right there. Oops. Now I've done it. Okay, I know what I know where that is. So we'll just handle getting everything else around it. So let's make that a, a 
lighter colored. So we, we are going to need to use a little white now. some of that. Oh, that's pretty. There we go. I like that. So the, there, the windows on this part, they go all the way over to the end, then they, over here they stop. So they go, these go all the way over to here to the end of the building. Okay, now since we're working on the, the with the lighter colors, we're gonna work on the buildings that are back here because I have I have it on my brush and I'm thinking about it right now. So I just want to get it in. This building here is a little darker. It's actually two buildings right there. I'll make this one behind it. A little bluer just to separate it. This one in here is all that's all lit up. It'd be nice nice to do later when we get into doing lights. So right now I'm just trying to set the stage. Figuring out some of the pieces to the puzzle. Setting the stage for the trolley car. So we're gonna work on all around here, then we're gonna get into this part. This will be last. A lot of people like to just jump into that. I like to wait for my focal point to, till towards the end. I mean, I might put a little bit of color on it just to have some color hints here and there so that I know later on what to do. But I like to save this because sometimes I need to adjust it, you know, so that it goes, adjust a drawing or whatever so that it goes with the surrounding area. It's like saving the best for last. That's the fun part for me. Experimental color number two. What is that called anyways? Let's look that up. Lilac Van Rose. Or oh, wait, Rose's Lilac. Yep. Rose's Lilac. Limited edition. <laughs> Sometimes I put these out on my palette and I, I don't even use them. But every now and then I, I try them out so just for fun. I'm just trying to separate some of the buildings. So we'll... That's why I'm using different colors. So you'll see it goes bluish, purple, blue, purple, which we can change later on if, we don't, if I don't like it. Tree comes up a little higher there.
And let's set up these ones back here. This one is a little darker. There's a little tiny hit of light right there with that. I like that. It's going to pop out. Just trying to make nice, clean shapes. Since I have this color here, this kind of goes with this one over here on the right. Oops, not that. Even lighter. some of that so I'm not battling it. window in. So I don't erase it with paint. There's windows back here too. Lay those in real quick. The tree overlaps them, so we'll be able to hide them a little bit. I just want them to poke through in some of the little holes of the tree. So this building here is a little lighter than I put down, but I'll, we'll adjust that in a little bit. I just want to get, I'm just trying to get all this stuff laid in, like I said earlier, to set the stage so we can start working on the foreground stuff. Same with these buildings right here.
I'm going to start to lay in the trees that are back here. I like the value that they're at right now. I'm just going to start laying in some dark colors. Like there's the darks that are in this tree back here and definitely back here. So we'll get going on those. Very similar to what I have going on with some of these buildings, but I want to separate it a little bit and probably add some more color to it. So I'll just use a bigger brush I have going on right here. Using some of the color that's already laid out, harmonizing my darks, some of my darks. And we'll, I'm just going to lay it in, get them in, and then I'll um, add the light later on them. Oops, that was part of that weird roof. Got to go around the bus, a little bus, a little bus. Not little, but it's little. We'll get this laid in here. It's all about setting the stage up. These are all like sycamores, so it was I was there in the fall when I took these, so I want to get some of that fall color in them. And just set a basic dark up and we'll play with it later. This tree right here is a different color. It's like, it's not a sycamore. I'm not sure what it is, but I like the fact that it's green. Let that window show through right there. It's just popping out a little bit. Let's make that a dark greenish color. So see, just setting it all up. Cities fascinate us. We love the energy, the colors, the sounds, and the people. Most of the world lives in cities, and cities are some of the most visited places for tourists. Many painters would love to take their paints to capture the vibe of the cities they visit, to create memories of their trips, to do paintings of the special places they visit, and to capture the feel of the energy and the people. Paintings of cities have been around since the beginning of cities. Edouard Cortez, Eugene Boudin, and Claude Monet painted the lights of Paris and London. Candeletto painted Venice. Child Hassan painted the caverns of New York skyscrapers. Now, a crazy man from Southern California has become a renowned city painter. Scott W. Pryor is known for not just documenting the city in paint, but capturing the feel and energy of the place he is painting. 
If you live in the city, you can learn how to walk down your own street and find an amazing scene. If you're visiting, you can create powerful memories. The key is learning how to take in all the information, how to simplify and paint the sounds, the colors, and the light so your paintings feel like the city. In this all-new video, Vibrant Cityscapes with Scott W. Pryor, you too can discover how to paint a city masterpiece, capturing all the details, such as light reflecting off building windows, people on the street, and the warmth of reflected light hitting a vehicle. Scott guides you step by step through the entire process as he paints a scene from San Francisco. You'll discover how to achieve the right perspective so things look right, how to paint a yellow subject in light and shadow. It's amazing what colors you will use, how to measure your proportions, the major two benefits of things overlapping in your paintings, why Scott leaves the best part as the last thing he paints plus a whole lot more. When you learn how to paint vibrant cityscapes like this, your skills as a painter can skyrocket, especially if you learn from Scott W. Pryor. Vibrant Cityscapes with Scott W. Pryor. Order yours today. Well, that was Scott W. Pryor, and the video is called Painting Vibrant Cityscapes, and you can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. Remember, there's a special discount code for today only in the comments section. Now, let's get right to our interview so you can get to know Scott W. Pryor. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plein Air, and Artist on Art magazines. Today we're interviewing the amazing Scott W. Pryor. Scott, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. How are you? So glad you're here. Thanks for having me. Oh man, this is an honor for us. So what I'm really curious about is what makes you tick, why you paint. We're going to get into all of that. But first tell me where you live, what's home, where's home, what's your family life like? Home is in Oceanside, California, and I have two daughters and a beautiful wife and two dogs, and Oceanside is northern San Diego County, uh -huh. but we're near the water, so we get to live the dream. And you grew up there? I grew up in, actually in Costa Mesa up in Orange County. Okay, so how'd you end up in uh, near San Diego area? The long story is um, basically my wife and I have lived all over California and when we went, I went to school, I went to the Academy of Art in San Francisco as you know and then we moved to LA and then it was time to buy a house. We ended up back in Orange County, bought a house in downtown Santa Ana, um, rode the tidal wave of the real estate market, sold it and then moved down to Oceanside basically better schools because our daughter was old enough she had to go into kindergarten and the school system in <laughs> Santa Ana is not so hot. Uh, well those are the things we have to think about. That's yes. For sure. So let's go to back to the very beginning. Uh, what are your first memories of being exposed to art or thinking about art? Um, my, well my grandparents my, on my dad's side my grandmother and my aunt both painted. So I always had them around painting birds and flowers and cutesy stuff. Were they any good? Yeah, they were decent. Yeah. They were decent, like hobbyists, definitely. But that was an uh, intro to it. And then like they always bought me stuff to paint and draw with, um, as, as, along with my mom too. So she was really into She does a lot of craft and toll painting and stuff. So. Um, I just kept doing it here and there and then as I got older I started doing it more because I got injured in sports or riding my motorcycle or you know so I'd be laid up with a broken foot or sprained ankle or something for many times and she's like here's a book learn how to draw these characters here's a sketch pad 
or some pastels ready go you know because uh -huh. reading wasn't i tried reading but i didn't that wasn't my thing so right. drawing and painting was became more of what i did so do you know how to read yeah yes <laughs> yes I, I do know how to read i'm just kidding <laughs> i read your magazines <laughs> good answer good answer so was that your your training then uh, when when you were asked to draw cartoons and, and so on? Uh, that started it, but when like getting into high school, I went more into the sports. So uh -huh. I wrestled and played football. Um, so the, I didn't really do the art thing during high school because of sports. And one of the teachers was my wrestling coach. So he taught silk screening and drawing. And I didn't, I already spent a lot of time with him. So I was like, I think I'll just, go this way and go do shop or whatever. Right. Um, and then when, six majors later, I ended up going into art. When you say six majors later. Yeah, after high school, going into college, I wrestled a little bit in college until I hurt my knee and then um, started pursuing um, physical therapy, uh, nutrition, communication, radio management, um, business of all things, and then was art. And I, I took a semester off after being let go from the San Diego State University. Because? I was having a lot of fun. Yeah, what kind of fun were you having? <laughs> San Diego State fun, partying lots. Yeah. Um, and then my grades, of course, slipped. So, and I didn't feel like begging. I was wasting my parents' money. So I took some time off and my mom's like, why don't you get back into art? And I was like, oh, bing, light bulb. Um, so I just kept going at that. And then next thing you know, I ended up going to the Academy of Art in San Francisco. So your mom knew it all along. She just had to kind of bring it back. Yes, yes. So you went to the Academy of Art in San Francisco. What year was that? I was there in 93, uh -huh. yeah, like 93, and then graduated in 97. And who were some of your teachers? I had Craig Nelson, Hui Han Liu, um, Zhao Ming Wu, Bill Mon, uh, Chuck Pyle, tons, tons and tons of people that wow. I studied with. I was fortunate that I worked with the school. So I had a job at Starbucks. There was a position in college work study open at school. I left Starbucks, started working with the director of the illustration department back then was Melissa Marshall. Um, and that basically was like a TA for her, go get me coffee, get me lunch, go set this class up for so-and-so. And so because I would be done, I was able to sit in with other teachers, draw with them. And also I got exposed to who was who um, and took classes from them and made my, made my schedule go around who, who was teaching. So you were really getting more education than you were supposed to by having that TA role? Yes. Don't tell Elisa Stevens that I was <laughs> sitting in on classes. <laughs> um, Elisa, <laughs> send him a bill. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, and it was great because I, I got, it was like boot camp and it was serious, all about drawing, design, painting, color, all, you know, in three and a half years of being there. Uh, did you get an MFA? BFA. A BFA. Yes. All right. And then after that, what happened? Well, I, I was, look, to back up a little bit, like the year before I graduated, Disney and all those animation companies were hunting for students and I, I opted to stay and be the second one in my family besides my dad to get a degree of, uh, from a four-year school. So had I left though, I could have had a job with all, you know, any one of them. Yeah. But I, I stayed in school to um, finish. That was probably a good decision. It was, it was, it felt really good. Um, and we had our own little bonding moment, which was nice. Uh, so then going forward, I was trying to get into, I was an illustration uh, major and painting 
uh, minor. So I was pursuing illustration in LA. Uh, we moved down to LA like almost right after I graduated, basically because my wife had an opportunity to get a better job. Wait a minute, you got married way back then? then. Yeah. All yes. Right. How married, old were you when you got married? 23. Yeah. Yeah, she, that was there backing up. That's kind of funny because I had met my wife at a club that I bounced at. Um, and it was a. So it was a trampoline club, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Punk rock club. Definitely uh, had a lot of fun there. And I met her there on a night, and um, then we hit it off. And I was like, I'm going to go to move to art school. I'm moving to San Francisco to go to art school. And she was like, well, I'm not moving with you unless we're married. And I said, cool, let's get married. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we're 23 years into it now. Ah, so. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks. So you got out of school. Got out of school. And then I went, we moved to L.A. And I was pursuing um, illustration jobs and showing my book around, trying to get into background painting. Uh, set design, whatever, you know, little niche I could find. And started apprenticing with Alan Hunter at Steiniger Ad in Beverly Hills, which was very interesting. And I also learned that I didn't really like the ad industry because of the amount of hours and time that people were working. You know, it was crazy. It's 12 to 18 hour days, sometimes no sleep. You know, but the money was great. You just never saw your family or your friends. Right. So. So you moved on from that, and then what'd you do? I fell into, um, at that time, I was also teaching at the Palos Verdes Art Center. So I was teaching drawing and pastels. Um, and one of my students had suggested that I go see a show that was at the Malaga Cove Library in Palos Verdes. And it was like Dan Pinkham, and two other people from the California Art Club. I think Gil Dillinger was in it as well. Um, and I, they're like, have you heard of the California Art Club? I'm like, no. I'm like, who's that, you know? Right. And then <clears throat> I stumbled onto like a newsletter because when I was, I was going through the files and stuff at the Art Center, at Palos Verdes Art Center, and I came across one of their catalogs. I'm like, oh, this is kind of neat, you know? And so the next day I went to the show and Dan was there, I met Dan because he lives right there. And um, he was discussing with the people to take the show down. And so I just introduced myself to him. And he was like, oh, we're looking for artist members. You should, you should submit. I was like, I don't even know you, you know? <laughs> artist so, members of the Palos Verdes. No, of the California Art oh, Club. Oh, the CAC, okay. Yeah, sorry. Right. He, uh, was like, are you a member of the California Art Club? I'm like, not yet. I don't even really know anything about it or, you know. So um, time went on to submit to become to, for an artist member. And I hadn't even been, I didn't join yet. I hadn't joined yet. So on a whim, I just was like, you know what? I'm going to submit for it. So you were doing painting. I was doing some painting on the side, um, minimal. And most, a lot of, you know, going around, showing my book around, trying to, right. trying to get a job, right. you know. Um, but I was, still, I was painting on the side. I was teaching two days a week. And then um, we had our, also at the same time, we had our first daughter. So I was Mr. Mom in it, you know, doing lots of waiting tables, doing whatever it took, you right. know. Sure. Um, <clears throat> then we, so last minute, I was like, I'm going to submit, called Dan, he answered. He's like, you should go submit. Here's the address. It's in Pasadena. I'm like, okay. And I got my stuff together and, you know, and last minute, of course, because that's how we roll as artists. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, I put all my, I got my photos together and my slides together and one of them was horrible. One of the reprints came out like crap and I was just like I can't deal with this and I was almost I almost didn't go so on the way to Pasadena I took our daughter to 
the office where my wife was, she was working for a clinic at that time, dropped her off. I called her, I said, hey, I need to drop off Hannah. I'm gonna go to submit for the California Art Club. And this is before cell phones, so you know, no texting, nothing like that. Get, and so I get up there and then at last minute, I'm like, I need to reprint this. I found a guy in downtown Pasadena, reprinted one of my images, made it to the, the uh, Adams house where I was dropping the stuff off at, um, Peter and Elaine Adams, who run the California Art Club, and <laughs> made it in time. And then that was that. Drove home in traffic <laughs> and just wait and waited to hear from them, you know, and I kind of forgot about it. And one day, like, I don't know, four months later, I go to get the mail and I'm, I opened the letter and I'm in, I made it in first try with the California Art Club as an artist member, which was no small feat back then and, and today. And some people get a little pissed about my story because I made it in first try. And all I did was submit. I didn't, you know, I don't know anybody. Right. You know, so right. it was exciting. So how, the, you, you brought that up for a reason. It impacted your career somehow. Direction. It made me go into fine art. It, it showed me, like God opened the door and I went into it. Yeah. You know. Had that Dan Pinkham show inspired you in some way because you had gone to an art show where there was art on display. It was, it, it, obviously he mentioned the California Art Club to you, but had, he, ha, had it been you know, seeing artwork out there that had made any difference? Well, I was painting plein air already. Oh, you were? Yes. Oh, you didn't mention that. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, at school, we didn't call it plein air. It was just going, we were doing outdoor studies. Yeah. So back at the academy, one of the classes that, we ha that I had was doing <clears throat> narrative painting. That was one class. And we went out and did, we went out and did an outdoor study with that class. And Craig even mentioned, yeah, they call it plein air, and I'm all, what the hell is plein air? Right. <laughs> you know? And so he's always just doing outdoor studies. So right. we're just going to go outside and paint. I'm like, oh, fun. You know? So we gathered our stuff up and made little Peshad boxes, and some of us did. Some yeah. people brought a lot of stuff out. But we, and we went outside and painted. You know? So we did that quite often. Then I took a landscape painting class with him, and uh, we went out for that. So I was already painting plein air. I just hadn't been in a group right. setting with anybody. And that was part of the show with Dan. So you got into the California Art Club. Yes. And then what happened? Got into the California Art Club, and that um, helped me focus in a direction in the art world. How did it help you focus? Well, to back up to school, I was looking at teaching um, with the academy, and Bill Mon, who was an instructor and mentor of mine, he uh, was like, if you can take time away from teaching and go take a couple years to four years to figure out who you are as an artist, do you want to be an illustrator? Do you want to be, you know, painter, fine art guy? You know, do that. So I, I took a little time off um, and was you know, doing some soul searching and trying to figure out who I was as Scott Pryor, Scott W. Pryor. There is another Scott Pryor artist, right? Yes. Funny thing is, his middle name is Wilson. Interesting. <laughs> Fortunately, he doesn't use his middle name. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, let's go back to this direction. Now you've figured out your direction. You wanted to paint fine art. Yes. So um, I got into my first plein air show was the La Quinta plein air invitational or whatever they call that. They don't, I, don't think, I don't think they do that show anymore. But that was the first plein air show that I ever got into. Um, <clears throat> I painted in that and basically had my ass handed to me. Because I, painting wise, I could hold my, my own. You know, you had Ken Oster, Jacobus Boss, John Cosby, Camille Przodwick, Robin Hall, um, a whole slew of plein air painters that were like 
La Papa members, Papa members, and CAC artist members, and I had not really met any of them yet. Um, how I had my ass handed to me was because of the frames. <laughs> I bought a bunch of cheap frames down in TJ, went down there with my grandfather, who knew a framer down there. In TJ meaning Tijuana. Tijuana, yes. And <laughs> bought a bunch of lower than upper grade frames and had people were like, you need to change your frames. I didn't sell anything at that show. I got, I got totally got skunked. But it was an, I, I learned a lot. That was a huge learning thing, you know, for me. Um, and then after that was the, uh, the first thing I, first time I painted with the CAC was at, uh, when the, back when they painted at the Mission in San Juan Capistrano. So I was involved in that and was, that was fun because it was like all CAC people painting on the grounds of the mission. We had a full run of the place. We could stay there at night, paint nocturnes, do whatever we wanted, you know, and they just let us do that. And then we had the weekend sale thing. And that's back when I met Jeremy and Jeremy Lip King, okay. Eric Merrill, all these guys that are in it today, you know, and we're all still friends. Some people have taken off with their careers and some of us are still Oh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> swimming. <laughs> you wouldn't be here in this interview if you were just swimming. <clears throat> so, swimming against the grain. And the rest, as they say, is history, right? Yes, yes. Any other key points? I tried to get into the Carmel Art Festival plein air show um, back, back then, and I got denied. Yeah. And I was like, well, what the hell? I know all these people in the show. How did I get denied? Because I'm... I'm I've been around, you know, I, I know people, I, why, why can't I get in? Well, you know, the juring process and stuff, and nobody knew me in and, and that circle. Um, so I called and I was like, my, I talked to my friend Terry Masters, who lives out in Palm Springs, and he was like, why don't you see if they'll have a waiting list? Okay, so I called, hey, do you guys have a waiting list? You're the first one on it. And then um, somebody pulled out and it turned out it was Carol Cook. She pulled out of the festival, so they had a spot open, and I got to go in like last minute, two weeks before the show, and I went up and had a great three days of painting. Won an honorable mention. My painting went for triple the asking price in the live auction, so I was like, all right, <laughs> this is good. Um, and that kind of like really kick-started like I can do something with this you know so so it gave you the confidence yes it definitely gave me the confidence three artists were the judges so my I was judged by my peers which felt awesome to see like oh wow I'm accepted by these guys right and which I mean in our world you, that feels really good right you know to have that and it definitely builds your confidence so I just started charging and going you know, as you said, the rest is history. So for the people who are, are watching this, um, let's go down a couple of rabbit holes if we can. The first rabbit hole is training and learning to paint. We have people who are watching this who are novices, maybe haven't even painted yet, or just starting out. We also have people watching this who are experienced pros. But now that you know what you know, you went to art school, you did a lot of drawing as a kid, you, <clears throat> you went out into the plein air circuit. Knowing what you know now, what would you advise someone to do? Would, they, would you advise them to follow the same track? Would you do something differently? Um, knowing what I know now, I would... I think for me, going to the school was the best thing for me to help build me up to be prepared um, but you don't have to go to school. You can, if you can find people, not one person, but people to study with. Why do you say not one person? That way you don't become a mini-me. Right. You want to become your own person. You right. want to have your own voice. You don't want to become John Singer Sargent, although that would be really awesome. That but. would be awesome. So, <laughs> so do, you, do you recommend doing that simultaneously, or you, know, you jump from one, learn what you can from one, then jump to another? Mix it up. Yeah. 
mix it up, act like you're in school, you know, and maybe do four weeks or whatever with, or four workshops with one person, then go to another person or rotate it, you know. While uh, all at the same time, though, you're doing your homework, you're working from life, you're drawing from life, you're, you're, you have to get as much of that in as possible to build the, your mileage. Drawing from life, meaning still life, meaning models, what? All the above, <clears throat> everything. Still life, the chair in front of you, your mom having coffee in front of you, um, having models posed for you, going sitting, you know, going to the drawing labs and painting labs, portraits, get out and study everything. Great. Always be drawing. A B D. Yes, always be drawing. And it, personally, if I'm not drawing, I'm looking at stuff like how would I solve that puzzle? Because everything's a puzzle to me. How do, can I figure that out? And I'm drawing it out in my head where I'd start, and you know, so I'm always seeking. So drawing is the foundation of everything? Yes. So if, if I say to you, look, I don't want to learn to draw, I just want to paint. I would say, okay, good luck with that. Learn, <laughs> learn, learn to draw. It's, well, draw, <clears throat> painting is drawing. You're just drawing with a brush. I, I probably have heard this a hundred times, if not a thousand times. Uh, I wish I could do that. I don't have any talent. I can't even draw a straight line. And what I say to them is, this is not about talent. This is not something you're born with. This is something that you learn. How do you feel about that? I, I agree with that. And I mean, there are some of us out in the art world that have what we call the mind, or at school we call it the Midas touch. And you can just draw and paint anything, anytime, first go, still life painting, beautiful. And then it's just like, they just keep going. But you have, I mean, to learn anything, you have to put time in, you know? And I think, you know, anybody who, if they have a desire to get into art, painting and drawing, they, you know, they'll learn it. And, and anybody can, you just have to tap into it and try, you know. And not give up. And not give up. I mean, it's, it's frustrating. You know, the hand-eye coordination thing is, is, you know, that's all brought on by mileage, at least for me. I, you know, I, didn't, I wasn't one of the Midas Touch kids in school. I had to work my ass off to, to, you know, and catch up. I went from a junior college taking, taking drawing and painting classes there and I was one of the better students there. And then when I went to the academy, I had my ass handed to me. I had kids, I was, I was studying with kids from Korea and China and Japan who had all been in art schools, you know, um, since six, six years old yeah. or eight or whatever when they got pulled out of their elementary school. Right. But I learned a lot from them as well. So you learn from the students too. So I learned like how to spin charcoal in my hand. I'm like, how do you keep that tip so fine? Because we're always, you know, shape, getting that fine tip, shaving it, you know, with a razor blade. And then I asked one of my friends, I'm like, how do you keep that so f that tip so fine? And he's like, I spin it in my hand. And I was like, ah, aha. So I tried it, and it was awesome. I was like, it just was mind blowing. That just a one thing, you know. So I, <clears throat> all these years, I've never heard that. We're talking about compressed round charcoal, number one, not the square ones. Um, and yeah, by when you're drawing a line, and if you spin. While you're drawing. While you're drawing, you're spinning it in your fingers. That keeps the tip nice and sharp. Oh, huh. do you still do that to this day? Yes. So talk to me about the importance of mentors, and when I say mentors, I'm really thinking in terms of two types of mentors, living and dead. Okay. All right, so you were probably inspired by people from the past. Who were they? Definitely. Um, Mucha, because of illustration background, uh, Alphonse Mucha was one of them. Um, Sargent, definitely. 
Um, some of the Kooning's work, um, even I, you know, there's some like Rothko, his abstract work. I liked his stuff, uh, but more I leaned more towards the traditional guys. Mm -hmm. uh, Plain Air, I was like Went and Payne and those guys. I, I admire their work, but I just saw too many people copying their style. Um, so I just try to stay away from that. Um, but definitely Sargent and Soroya, I would say, were the two big ones for me. Um, living artist, Bert Silverman, was one of them. It is still one of them. Um, you mentioned Max Ginsburg earlier, uh, maybe last night or whatever. Um, but he was like, we had heard about him through, through school and the, you know, the academics. Um, and Everett Raymond Kinsler for his portrait work. Um, I, I mean, I can keep going. There's a lot of them, you know, today. And back when Bill Mon told me, suggested to me that I take some time off, he also suggested not looking at books. Hmm. So that he's all, don't watch book, don't look at books and don't watch videos. Sorry. <laughs> don't pay attention to that <laughs> don't, advice. Don't listen bad to me. Bad advice. Don't Very listen to me. bad advice. Don't listen to me. Um, and so I, I, I wasn't really watching videos anyways, but I was like the book thing. We all like to collect books and look, you know, and drool over who's doing or what this guy did. Or, right, right. So I put my books away and just tried to study as much as I could from life or pulling stuff out of my head, drawing in my sketchbook. Trying to, you know, just trying to get things down. And that's, that helped me a lot to get my own voice. Um, well, that's difficult. That, that's one of the most common questions that I get is how do I get my own voice? Because um, there are a lot of copycats out there, there are a lot of people who will study under someone and watch a video, and read it, look at a book, et cetera. And those are all important if you keep one thing in mind, and that is that you're, you're learning what they've learned, but you're not trying to be them. Yes. Right. So how do you get your own voice, and how do you know when you have it? That's a good question. Um, I think it was, it was just by trial and error, really, like experimenting. I'm still, I don't know, in some ways, I'm still developing who I am as a painter, because you know, I experiment with while I'm painting in the studio or outside, like thin washes to thicker, you know, painting thicker, um, just letting stuff happen. And sometimes it's an accident, you know. Happy so, accidents. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, and it's hard to, to figure that out. It's not the easiest thing to do. You just have to have the confidence in yourself that what you're doing is working in a way. And whether the, it, I think having your peers help you sometimes that helps because like, their help is by going, that's a great painting, you know, or that's an awesome drawing. Like, and you know, I really, it's a really good question. <laughs> one, one of the, uh, one of the things that, that often would happen to me <clears throat> is that I'd be painting with a group of people and I'd take a break and I'd wonder and I'd look at what other people were doing and I'd see how they handled a particular piece in the scene and then I'd go back and I'd start changing mine and, and I finally got to the point where I said, you know what, I can't, first off, I can't go look um, because I don't want to be influenced by what they're doing and secondly, I can't care what they think. I just got to think about what I'm doing and do exactly. it for me. Because you're, if, you, if you do it, if you care too much about what other people think, then you're going to be constantly adjusting to that and trying to chase that. You think that's? I agree. I There's like one instant, like I was out painting with the California Art Club and it was kind of sunset time and I remember seeing Michael Situ and I was like, what did you use for your sunset color? And he explained to me and he mixed it on his palette. And I was like, oh, thank you. 
because I was having issues with that. Um, and then I went back and adjusted my color on my painting, not looking at his style or anything, but just the color. Um, and that helped my painting, you know, so I'm still learning from other artists and stuff. I do these events uh, where we gather a bunch of artists together. They're basically artist retreats, like we have the, the event we have in the Adirondacks, which is a hundred painters who just get together in the Adirondack Mountains and paint. And one of the values of that is that sometimes there are 20 or 30 of us in the same spot, and in spite of the danger of you know changing everything you know when you do go around and you look at what everybody else is doing you do see the possibilities the key is not allow it to affect you necessarily at that moment in time although sometimes you'll see something really good you have to do but the uh, to, to see how 20 people interpret the same scene or, or we bring all our paintings in at night, we call it the catch for the day, right? And we bring them all in at night and we look at everybody's paintings. And then you see how different people have approached it, how they've, how they've approached it with knives or with brushes or with colors or, you know, compositions that are completely different. And it's a big learning experience. Yeah, yep. But, like to back up, you were saying like to not be influenced by the, like, I, I totally agree with that. Like, it's really hard to not be influenced by people though, you know, and, and to look at other people's stuff, you can't, like you're saying, you can't care about what other people think. You have to, like, you have to drive forward with what you're doing, but to, you can still be influenced, but you can't let that overstate your style or, you know, you have to be your own person. Well, the foundation of what you've painted, you know, let's say you've painted for a couple of hours and you're going in a particular direction and then you go off and you see somebody else had a completely different composition and then you go in and you try to work it into yours, it screws it up. You, you can want to remember it for later. Yes. Um, but now, now, a lot of people that I know like yourself are constantly in a learning mode um, attending other people's workshops or getting out and specifically painting with somebody who does something that you want to learn how to do. Yeah. Now, do you do that kind of thing? <clears throat> I was invited to a weekend with a master's kind of a workshop thing in San Diego through some other mag, I forget who the magazine was. Um, They're out of business. Yeah, oh, yeah, them. They're out, they are. Um, <laughs> they, I, so I had a free pass, they invited me to come, and I sat in with David Casson for a day, um, learning how he, you know, trying to refine my portraiture, because I was trying to get back into painting portraits after a few years of not being, not doing them. And then the next day, I took a workshop with Dan Gerhardt's, and two totally different approaches, you know, but I, I got a lot out of it, and I got to see them work, and how they work. That's my big thing, I, you know, like painting with them is fun, you know. You've been to the plein air convention. Yes. Tell me about that experience. Uh, tell our audience about that experience from your perspective. Um, it was rather awesome to have our tribe together in that mass, with that many people. Because we were all in our own little world. Sometimes we get to go paint with friends you know, one or two, or in my, that's in how I do it. Um, or like I used to do the plein air, a lot of the different shows throughout the country, and we'd have, you know, three or four of us would meet up and paint. So it's fun, you know, and that, the convention itself was like painting with your friends overload. So it was, it was like super fun to be able to get together with a large amount of people make new friends, see old friends, and talk about what we do. Talk shop, you know? My wife's tired of talking shop with me. <laughs> My kids are like, Dad, come on. So uh, it was really fun. Scott, you, you were selling your work how? Um, mostly nowadays, it's direct. But I am in, I'm still in two galleries, one back east, and Helena Fox, and... Um, American Legacy Galleries in uh, Pasadena, LA area. Great galleries. Great galleries. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it's, it's not easy to get into either one of those, so that's a testament to the quality of your work. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, and in fact, both of which, when they asked me, I was already in other galleries. So at one point I was in like, I don't know, six or seven galleries, and it was hard to keep up. Yeah. Um, so when they, because galleries change, as we know, and like I was in one in, for example, I was in uh, one in Vail, and when I first was in there, the first two years, I mean, within the first three months of being in the gallery, they sold like 33 paintings. And I was like, wow, you know, this is awesome. And then their, their clientele changed because the economy changed here. Their clientele, they were getting more South American uh, clients coming up and spending time in Vail. So they changed their whole like, gallery to mostly a contemporary style gallery and asked me to leave because they stopped selling my paintings, which is fine because I was selling in other markets and, you know, and so I've just thinned the herd out a little bit so that I can be in two higher end galleries. So back when the topic came up again, hey, do you want to be with us? I was like, yes, because I'm right now I'm like moving things around, changing some things up. And like you said, they're hard to get into. Um, and they both accepted me. So it was kind of almost at the same time. And it's been good. So uh, what is it that you haven't painted yet that you, maybe you have this dream of uh, the ultimate painting you want to do? Maybe it has to do with size. Maybe it has to do with place. Uh, is there some dream in the back of your head that you're kind of noodling and trying to figure out how you're going to get it done? And wh what is it? Yeah, actually, I do have, I have something <clears throat> that would, that's in the back of my head that I keep coming up with, like, different ideas. Um, and it would be doing, because other, you know, Dolly and other people have done modern-day crucifixion scenes. Mm -hmm. So I have an idea of painting one that involves a tow truck. <laughs> That's as far as I'm going to go with it. Yeah, well, you don't want to give <laughs> the idea I don't want away. to give it away. Is this a big painting? Yeah, it would be a big painting. Yeah. It would be, like, the biggest I've done so far is, like, 4860. Yeah. Um, outside, 3040. Oh, you did a mural. I remember seeing something on Facebook or something about you doing a mural. Is that right? Yes. Recently, I did a mural um, for a friend's restaurant and had to go deep in the archives of my brain of how to work as an illustrator to come up with the idea. So it's kind of like a Ed Roth meets a flying pig. So what do you, what do you paint with when you do a mural because it's got to stand up to the weather? Yeah, I painted, I used um, acrylics basically through um, Royal Talons, use their brand, because mm -hmm. it bonds with the cement and the stucco. How do you find that stuff out? through the people that work for the company. <laughs> Duh. I, the, yeah, well, the, normally we just use house paint, you know, and I've done some murals with friends and where I live and helped out here and there a little bit, and this one was all me on my own. And I was talking to Kyle from Royal Talons, and he's like, let me send you some paint and you can use it. So I said, sure, that sounds great. And it came out great, it was really fun to do. It took me longer than I thought, yeah. Because I thought three days would be good, and then six days into it, I was done. <laughs> well, six but, days is pretty big. How big was the mural? Uh, it's like a eight foot, no, 10 by 13 foot wall. Well, that's huge. So. That'd take a lot, more, a lot more time for most people. Yeah, it was projectors. Got to use projectors. <laughs> now, do you use projectors when you're normally working in the studio? No. No, sometimes um, I have like just to speed up the process, but for the most part, no. I but in the mural, you pro you came up with a, uh, an image, you drew it out, projected it on the wall, sketched it. <clears throat> I did not project it. Oh, you did not. No. Oh. But no I have the um, owner of the restaurant. They own another restaurant in Oceanside, and so I'm going to do a mural on that wall, and I'm going to basically use a projector just to speed the drawing part up this next time around 
So you'll draw it out on a sheet of paper or something, and then you'll you'll photograph that, project that. Yes. Okay. So you're still drawing it. Yes. You know, we're really excited that you've been in here today. It's been fun learning about you. Is there anything else that maybe people will never find out about you that this is the opportunity to reveal? You're a bit of a rebel. I'm a bit of a rebel. You're, you're actually more than a bit of a rebel. Do you, want to, <laughs> you want to talk about that? Um, I kind of, it's pretty, I don't know how, this has to do with how, like, how I was, not how, it has, some of it has to do with how I was raised. Yeah. You know, and there were there have been times that have been. I mean, I grew up as a middle class kid in Costa Mesa, but there's times where, like, I got into the music scene of the punk rock and stuff like that. Which most people know that I'm pretty open about all of stuff I do, um, but I definitely go against the grain. Yeah and am known for speaking my mind and have put my foot in my mouth more than once or twice or five times uh, because of that. And I've learned from that. Don't speak your mind too much. You'll make people upset. Um, well, you know, it's interesting because you and I first met probably 15, 16 years ago. Yes. And uh, you were a bit of a jerk at that time. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah. you, you and I spent a week together in Cuba when we did our historic Cuba painting trip before it was open to the Americas. And um, you, you totally have transformed. You've become a really great guy and, and fun to be with, and yet, yet you've maintained a little bit of that rebellious nature, which I think comes across in your painting. Yeah. I think that's a good thing. I, I, that's the one place that I get to keep it. Right. You know, yeah, you don't want to lose that. I mean, I don't want to, you know, for those who I've made mad or whatever in the past, I'm sorry. You know, it's not like I intended to do it, but sometimes there's part of me that intended to do it too, because you're, you know, I like to rock the boat. Yeah. And with some of the shows I've been in, I've voiced my opinion about how they could change some things and they didn't like it. And then eventually they'd end up changing it. I'm like, told you, you know. <laughs> I mean, here you won't invite me back. <laughs> yeah. well, maybe, well, maybe it was the, maybe it was the style in which it was presented. I totally agree, and I will admit, I've um, going to therapy is a good thing. <laughs> it's helped soften some edges. So, what do you hope uh, to be remembered by? If you, if you were to get hit by the truck today, um, what? What do you want to be known as? Oh, geez. That I, I'm willing to help others with their art career and not have my hand out. You know, I've, I've come a long ways and it's time to, it's been time to give back. And I mean, I tried to start a school, which I'm still trying to start a school, but that's a whole other deal. And it's just about helping others, you know. I find there's kids in my where I live, and they know, they know who I am and what I do, and they're like, I want that. I am a little intimidating to see walking around at times because of my size, tattoos, beard, and whatever. And that those that have, have approached me, and I'm like, dude, here's my number. Call me. Come over. You know. Well, how much does that cost? I'm like, you're a student. It costs you nothing. You just have to spend the time, you know. So, and you know, family guy obviously loves his family. And final thoughts for people who are on the journey, trying to learn to paint. Work hard. What's gotta, that mean? You got to put the work in. It's not just, you know, you got to spend the time doing it. You got to practice. And whether, if you're, even if you're not physically practicing with painting or drawing or whatever, you're thinking about it, you know? But I, I drive by a spot, like today on the way here, I'm looking around going, what, what can I paint? You know, ooh, that's cool. <laughs> I gotta go check that area out, you know? So I'm always trying to learn something and 
so like the best thing, another thing is to be open and learn from all your experiences. You know, like when we went to Cuba, that was awesome. Cause I mean, not to go back to politics and the art world and stuff, but I was kind of down and that trip came around and it just gave me a kick in the ass. So it make, made me get back out and do stuff, you know, and be with friends and, you know, get out there and paint. So you, and think about stuff and be exp exposed to new things to get the inspiration going. So that way you're constantly recharging your um, inner artist. Well, this has been awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been an honor. Well, that was Scott W. Pryor, Painting Vibrant Cityscapes. And you can learn more about it at Lily Art Video. Dot com. Remember, there's a special discount code in the comments section. Look for it there so that you can get a special discount on the full video. Thank you for watching. Cities fascinate us. We love the energy, the colors, the sounds, and the people. Most of the world lives in cities, and cities are some of the most visited places for tourists. Many painters would love to take their paints to capture the vibe of the cities they visit, to create memories of their trips, to do paintings of the special places they visit, and to capture the feel of the energy and the people. Paintings of cities have been around since the beginning of cities. Edouard Cortez Eugene Boudin and Claude Monet painted the lights of Paris and London. Candeletto painted Venice. Child Hassam painted the caverns of New York skyscrapers. Now, a crazy man from Southern California has become a renowned city painter. Scott W. Pryor is known for not just documenting the city and paint, but capturing the feel and energy of the place he is painting. If you live in the city, you can learn how to walk down your own street and find an amazing scene. If you're visiting, you can create powerful memories. The key is learning how to take in all the information, how to simplify and paint the sounds, the colors, and the light so your paintings feel like the city. In this all-new video, Vibrant Cityscapes with Scott W. Pryor, you too can discover how to paint a city masterpiece capturing all the details, such as light reflecting off building windows, people on the street, and the warmth of reflected light hitting a vehicle. Scott guides you step by step through the entire process as he paints a scene from San Francisco. You'll discover how to achieve the right perspective so things look right, how to paint a yellow subject in light and shadow. It's amazing what colors you will use, how to measure your proportions, the major two benefits of things overlapping in your paintings, why Scott leaves the best part as the last thing he paints, plus a whole lot more. When you learn how to paint vibrant cityscapes like this, your skills as a painter can skyrocket, especially if you learn from Scott W. Pryor. Vibrant Cityscapes with Scott W. Pryor. Order yours today.